Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, Research Director at NIICE, I welcome you all to an exclusive session by Ambassador Kaval Sibyl on India's Neighborhood First Policy, brought to you by the Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement. NIICE is an independent, apolitical, and nonpartisan think tank whose belief lies in freedom, democracy, and a world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. And all these webinars are just a step forward to make this vision turn into a reality. Talking about today's session, our esteemed guest for the day is Ambassador Kaval Sibyl. Ambassador Sibyl joined the Indian Foreign Service in July 1966, eventually began serving as the Foreign Secretary of India. He has served as Ambassador of India to Turkey, Egypt, France, and Russia, besides having served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Washington, D.C. with ambassadorial rank. He is currently a member of the Executive Council of the International Foundation and on the board of the New York-based East-West Institute. He writes prolifically on international affairs and is a Padma Shri awardee for 2017. We welcome you, sir. We're glad that you could join us today. Uh, before I hand over the session to you, sir, for the next 20, 25 minutes, I'd like to put a notice of the audience that this session is streaming live on our Facebook channel. So please feel free to like, share, and comment. Furthermore, we as organizers expect you to mention questions in the chat box for Ambassador Sibyl to answer them in the second half of the session. Uh, with this, sir, I now hand over the floor to you for the next 25 minutes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to appear on your uh, uh, digital platform, uh, especially since uh, it is uh, in Nepal, and uh, although it's not mentioned in my biodata, I was Deputy Chief for Mission and Shadid Affairs in Nepal uh, for three years. Uh, so I know the Nepal scene extremely well, although it's a bit outdated perhaps because that was uh, many, many years ago. Um, now, as regards the subject, there are two ways I can approach it. Uh, one is uh, to speak about the actual details of our, uh, of our neighborhood first policy in terms of uh, what we are doing uh, with our neighbors specifically uh, in uh, economic terms, development terms, uh, and so on. The other is uh, to look at the subject uh, more strategically uh, in terms of uh, um, what can be, ought to be the contents of India's neighborhood first policy in practical terms, and whether whatever our conception of neighborhood first policy um, is it uh, is it possible to manage it and progress it the way we want? Because we are dealing with independent sovereign countries who have their own uh, uh, priorities, and there are also external actors in our region. Um, and then there are other issues which I'll mention, uh, which uh, create issues in our relations uh, with our neighbors, and those have to be overcome to mutual satisfaction before we can give more depth uh, to our neighborhood first policy. In other words, we are not the sole actors in terms of uh, shaping uh, India's neighborhood first policy. It has to be done on the basis of a consensus uh, in our neighborhood at large. Then of course, there is the whole issue of uh, what is India's neighborhood? Uh, it's an important question uh, because uh, if you look at uh, the neighborhood in the strategic terms, then this neighborhood, uh, from our point of view, would extend virtually from the Gulf of Hormuz uh, to the Straits of Malacca, uh, spanning the entire uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, and with good reason, uh, because uh, if, for example, India had not got uh, divided, uh, India would have a border directly with Iran, for instance. And if you look eastwards, uh, because of Andaman and Nicobar Islands, uh, we are very close uh, maritime neighbors of Indonesia. Uh, so if we have to look at our neighborhood first policy, 
we should be clear in our own minds what constitutes our neighborhood. But then if we look at uh, neighborhood purely geographically uh, and not strategically, um, then uh, clearly it is the SARC countries, which now include uh, uh, Afghanistan, as well as uh, Myanmar, which uh, is not a member of SARC, although they had been invited to join, uh, but with which we have direct contiguity. Uh, so um, that's the first point I would like to make, that uh, uh, we have to, India, to my mind, has to look at our neighborhood first policy in the larger strategic perspective and not limited to uh, SARC uh, plus uh, uh, Myanmar. Um, the, uh, you know, the, and another fact, another thing which I must mention at the outstart, uh, at the outset is that uh, uh, we have uh, a neighbor to our north, China, uh, which uh, to my mind became uh, a neighbor by its occupation of Tibet, because historically India and China have never had uh, common frontiers at all. And the Hans never foot, set foot <laughs> in our area. But because they occupied the Tibet, now they become a direct contiguous uh, neighbor. And therefore, our neighborhood policy has to take into account the China factor, which has become more and more important uh, to us uh, strategically and otherwise, because China is uh, very active in our neighborhood, particularly active in Nepal. And uh, this raises uh, many, many issues uh, for us because uh, China does affect materially our relationship uh, with uh, our other neighboring uh, uh, countries, both uh, contiguous or whether it's or not contiguous in terms of land frontiers, but otherwise maritime, in, in the maritime sense, contiguous like uh, Sri Lanka and, uh, and Maldives. Now, since you, I'm sure all of you have been following in one way or another India's uh, foreign policy and the statements that our leaders make, especially when new governments uh, come to power, they always uh, stress that uh, they will give priority uh, to our neighborhood. And Prime Minister Modi has done that too. Uh, he has been emphasizing that uh, India's uh, uh, neighborhood first policy is the preferred uh, priority so far as India's foreign policy is concerned. Um, you know, the general feeling always is that uh, management of relations with neighbors is uh, very important because a stable uh, neighborhood uh, helps uh, to uh, helps your foreign policy uh, posture. Uh, you are not then embroiled in firefighting immediately in your neighborhood and can therefore, uh, in depending on your capacities, uh, act regionally and beyond the region, even at the international stage. But if you are constantly bogged down, as I said, in uh, firefighting in your neighborhood, then that to that extent, uh, the international profile of your foreign policy gets, uh, gets uh, affected. Uh, the other thing I'd like to my mention is that uh, uh, all big countries, or even not so big countries, have problems with neighbors. It is just a fact of life. Even in human societies, you have problems with neighbors. But when you're dealing with uh, countries, or sovereign countries, you will have uh, inevitably uh, problems. And if you look historically uh, at, uh, at the problems uh, neighbors have had, um, you would see that this is the pattern. Today, for example, uh, China, which uh, has more neighbors than we have, uh, it has problems uh, uh, with, uh, with all its neighbors, barring Pakistan. And in fact, uh, the relationship between China and its neighbors in the South China Sea uh, is deteriorating badly with the ASEAN uh, as a whole. Uh, Russia has huge problems with its neighbors after the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know what happened in, uh, in Ukraine. Now is what is happening in Belarus, uh, in Georgia, uh, in Turkey, and uh, also with some Central Asian states uh, who do not wish to be 
uh, under the grip of, uh, of Russia and uh, have managed uh, to either bring in the Americans uh, to a limited extent, uh, but of course the Chinese in a big way in order to uh, be free from uh, total control you know, by, by Russia. United States has huge problems with its neighbors. <laughs> Despite the fact that the neighbors don't pose any strategic military challenge to them, but they have huge, they have problems with Canada, they have problems with Mexico, and further afield, if you look at uh, Nicaragua or Venezuela or Cuba, they're not able to have uh, steady, friendly relations uh, with these, these countries. Therefore, uh, to my mind, uh, if the assumption behind uh, neighborhood first policy is that uh, we will have necessarily very friendly uh, close ties and there will not be difficult problems, then I think that assumption is, uh, is wrong. The other is that uh, the argument that if you don't have a peaceful, stable and friendly neighborhood, uh, then somehow uh, your rise will be affected. Uh, but uh, then again, if I can mention some instances in history that uh, UK, uh, when it rose to power, uh, had serious problems with neighbors and in fact uh, had constant wars with them. So did France. Uh, and uh, China's rise has not been affected by the problems with its uh, neighbors, nor has that of the uh, United States. If you look at Turkey today, it has unfriendly relations with virtually all its neighbors, but it's become a sort of a, a regional power. Uh, the other point I'd like to mention is that while in theory, a peaceful, stable, friendly neighborhood uh, appears to be obviously a good thing in terms of uh, uh, foreign policy of a country. Uh, but uh, what does it mean in practical terms? Uh, uh, can we have good relations with neighbors simply because it is desirable in itself? Can we build these relations uh, unilaterally? Uh, to what extent should one be willing to make uh, concessions? And in particular, uh, unilateral concessions. Should we look for reciprocity or not? Is it always the responsibility of the bigger country uh, to make the requisite uh, effort in forging positive relationship? Uh, is a smaller country always right in its demands and, uh, and, uh, and, expectation, and expectations? Uh, can a smaller country um, demand uh, extra consideration simply because it is uh, uh, smaller? Um, so, you know, these are some of the practical issues that you have to face when, you've, when you forge a, a policy of neighborhood first. I mean, in theory, it looks all right, but uh, in terms of how the implementation part, it is not, uh, uh, it's not always easy. Now, the point is that uh, the countries in one's neighborhood uh, uh, would always look for... Uh, uh, especially when it comes to a big country like India, which is overwhelmingly big with regard to its neighbors, will look for uh, balancing equations with other powers, uh, so that uh, uh, they, they, their own margin for maneuverability is increased, or at least it's not uh, limited beyond what would be uh, desirable. So they would like to uh, bring in an external power uh, to balance what might be a hegemonic a seemingly hegemonic power in the in the in the neighborhood. Uh, so uh, an external power too, uh, when it comes to a country like India, which has the potential of uh, becoming a major power in due course, uh, external actors would also like to uh, be present in the region and uh, pursue policies which would give them options to put pressure on India. Uh, China is a fine example of this. In the past, the United States was a, was a good example, but now the United States and India have developed a great deal of consensus in terms of managing uh, the broader Indian Ocean area and the literal, literal states. And therefore, the capacity of the countries in that region, including Pakistan, uh, to play the United States against us has been constrained, is limited. Uh, but of course, when it comes to China, then frankly, uh, virtually all our neighbors, barring Bhutan, 
uh, play the China card against us uh, in the manner in which they think it ought to be played to advance their own uh, interests and have options vis-a-vis uh, -vis India. Uh, my own belief is that uh, India's capacity to order its neighborhood in a manner congenial to its requirements uh, is limited and should not be uh, exaggerated. Uh, we did intervene in Sri Lanka in agreement with the government, but that experience uh, has left us chastened to the point that we uh, shied away from playing any role when uh, the Sri Lankan government was fighting against the LTT and finally uh, eliminated them. Uh, look at terrorism. I mean, I would say that India is a country that is most targeted by terrorism uh, from the neighborhood. And we are not able to uh, find a, 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 a solution uh, to this. Uh, Pakistan, uh, from our point of view, is the epicenter of terrorism. But the international community, acting through the United Nations, is, is not unable to force Pakistan uh, to, uh, to eradicate it. Uh, till today, they have not tried the, the people who were responsible for the uh, Mumbai uh, terrorist attacks, for instance. Um, on this issue, barring uh, the Afghan government, which has suffered a great deal itself uh, from terrorism emanating from Pakistan, uh, all the other countries, uh, barring Bhutan, uh, keep a political distance uh, from this issue. Uh, there, there's virtually no statement ever issued uh, by any of our neighbors, uh, which uh, specifically uh, support India and, and uh, accept the fact that Pakistan is uh, responsible for uh, promoting uh, terror uh, uh, in India. Uh, uh, now, I must say that Pakistan's uh, hostility towards India's promotion of terrorism and, this is, and the Islamization of the country and radicalization of the country is a problem that's going to, is affecting and will affect us more and more because we have Muslim communities in our own countries, and we have to protect them against radicalization. And, and therefore, it is a common threat. We've had, of course, within TARC, this agreement on combating terrorism, but that is only on paper, and there's no implementation of the agreement. The issue about uh, unilateral concessions versus reciprocity. Now, even a big country has, a pub has public opinion and must, must demonstrate to the public that when it is making concessions, uh, they are getting something in return. Uh, it may not be, uh, you know, one thing against another or in the same area, but the concessions, you make a concession in one area and the other country can make a, con make a concession in some other area where India may be interested. Therefore, there is some kind of a balance, not equal balance, but some kind of a balance where there is a degree of reciprocity, not, not not uh, forced upon a country, but which is a product of a normal management of uh, bilateral uh, relations. Um, sometimes I argue that, you know, this whole business, because of our public opinion, sometimes say sections of our public opinion say that, no, no, we should not insist on reciprocity because we are the bigger country, we have more resources, and we can make more sacrifices, etc., etc. Then I say, well, look, in that case, the US foreign policy should all to be based on even making unilateral concessions because it's the strongest country in the world and can sacrifice a great deal. But the United States is the country which uh, actually imposes uh, unilateral sanctions and punishments of all kinds uh, on all sorts of countries. Uh, and so it goes beyond reciprocity. Actually, it is coercion in terms of forcing other countries to accept their laws and act in accordance with their uh, foreign policy interests. Now, when it comes to our own region, uh, the point is that, uh, you know, it's, it's not that India has to boast about it, but it is a fact of history that India being a civilizational state, uh, aspects of its civilization and culture and everything else uh, are deeply, uh, have, de have deep influence or links with the countries around. Uh, but the countries uh, around, uh, do not want to be submerged into what may be the, broadly speaking, Indian civilization. So then the question of 
identity comes in. Uh, so that uh, even these civilizational cultural links, uh, at least in our region, become a source of uh, problems. Uh, ethnic links become a source of problems. You know, we have a diaspora around the world, and uh, that diaspora has increasingly become a, an arm in terms of uh, developing friendship with countries where this diaspora is, as for example, in the United States. But we have uh, ethnic links with Nepal, we have ethnic links with Sri Lanka. So instead of they becoming the building blocks of a people-to-people -people relationship, actually they have become a source of problems. Because these uh, ethnic links are occasionally, or in fact seen as um, uh, links that may provide India with a handle uh, to interfere in the domestic politics of our neighboring uh, uh, countries. Uh, so we, we lose the advantage of that in our, in our uh, neighborhood. Briefly on China, I will not dwell very much on it. I, I, we, 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 as I said, they have become a neighbor by force. Um, and now they have enormous resources at their command, uh, enormous financial resources. They have very ambitious projects like the Belt and Road Initiative. I can understand personally that uh, countries in that region may not support our view of the Belt and Road Initiative because if they feel they can derive some developmental advantages from China's willingness to invest in, in those countries, they'll do that in their own interest. And uh, they would then argue that, look, it, these can't be exclusive relationships just because we are close to you doesn't mean that we don't have to be close to China. That logically from their point of view is fine. My only argument is that, uh, my only view is that in doing this, uh, our neighboring countries also should keep in mind uh, the security sensitivities of India and adjust their policies in a practical way, in a way, in a way that does not cause concern to India. In other words, they also have a responsibility uh, in, in taking into consideration uh, this with India uh, in shaping their policies uh, uh, towards uh, China. Uh, China now has made it tremendous inroads into Nepal. And since we are, you are based in Nepal, I think uh, one of the most difficult challenges today we have, barring our relationship with Pakistan, is handling our relationship with Nepal uh, for, for reasons that you might, you might know. Um, Afghanistan present, presents us with uh, problems, potential problems of a grave nature, because if the Taliban comes to power, such an obscure entist organization, as they're likely to, then uh, the whole region can get infected by this progressively. And uh, therefore, we have a common interest uh, to prevent that, but we are helpless because uh, uh, the developments there are beyond the uh, control, even of India. Pakistan is absolutely the key player. But then Pakistan itself, as I said, is getting increasingly, uh, increasingly um, I would say that in terms of our neighborhood first policy, um, Bhutan, to my mind, and I have said that uh, before in, in speaking and writing, is the, is the only real success story that we have uh, of uh, a good, stable, friendly, non-problematic uh, relationship and one of the key elements in this is that they don't play the China card against us. And they've kept their distance not only from China but from all uh, great powers. Uh, and uh, they, they uh, and this, to my mind, points to the fact that good relations between India and its neighbors depends also on the wise policies of the governments of our neighboring countries. And it's not only the obligation of the government of India. Uh, then, uh, what can I do? Now, can I, can I then say something a little bit? Uh, how much time do I have left or do you think I can stop here? Uh, sir, if you don't have five I've spoken minutes, you for 24 minutes already. Five huh? more minutes. Okay. Now, just very, very briefly, I won't, uh, I won't, uh, expand on this because you can read all this on the internet as to what exactly is happening in our relations between India and our neighboring countries. But let me just make some broad points. 
that uh, uh, in our judgment, uh, India's relations with Bangladesh are about the best that they have ever been. And uh, very close ties have, have been developed between the two countries at the political uh, level. Certain things have been Bangladesh was absolutely resisting. Uh, and I've, I have been dealing with that personally when I was in office. Uh, today they are cooperating fully with regard to transit rights and, uh, and uh, evicting from their soil uh, anti-Indian uh, insurgents. Uh, India has solved its uh, maritime boundary with uh, Bangladesh, sorted out the problem of uh, Ongaves. We have, we share now uh, power supplies uh, with that country. Uh, we have agreements on inland water uh, transit, uh, etc., etc. In fact, Bangladesh has become now a vital platform in our uh, Act East policy. Earlier on, our act, act East policy was skirting Bangladesh, but Bangladesh was not cooperating. Now they are, there's a lot of potential in also uh, using Bangladesh as a platform uh, for our Act East uh, policy. Interestingly, we have offered a credit line uh, for defense procurement by Bangladesh from India because China is the biggest defense partner of Bangladesh. But the fact that they're willing to look at uh, uh, defense supplies from India is also psychologically and politically a major step uh, uh, forward. Um, the, uh, with Maldives, there has been a total turnaround in our relationship. Uh, we had very, very difficult moments uh, when Yamin was in power, but with President Soli, uh, the whole atmosphere has changed. And uh, when we say neighborhood first, uh, the Maldives government is now saying that for them it is India first. Uh, so I hope the Chinese won't play mischief again, <laughs> but, but I think at the moment our relationship with all these are very fine. And some of the issues that have arisen on the defense side uh, have been, uh, have been uh, sorted out. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has paid a lot of attention to Sri Lanka, a lot of attention in terms of uh, bilateral visits uh, and uh, very spoken often of uh, the importance we attach to Sri Lanka. Uh, in our neighborhood uh, first policy. And we've been able to manage some of the difficult issues in our relationship. Uh, although um, uh, you know, the kind of inroads China has made into Sri Lanka are uh, difficult to roll back, uh, but yet the relationship has become uh, much better than it was. Uh, and we hope the Prime Minister Oli's government in Nepal uh, will not, uh, will contribute to stabilizing India Nepal uh, ties rather than what I see is an attempt to seriously damage the long-standing friendly ties between India and, and Nepal. And about Bhutan, I've already uh, said something. And the last point I want to make is on BIMSTEC. Now, CISAC cannot uh, progress and it will not progress in the foreseeable future because Pakistan will not let happen. And our relationship with Pakistan become blocked even more than before. And the China-Pakistan nexus has become even stronger. China is now committing aggression against India in the dark. Uh, and we seriously face with a potential two-front situation. So whatever the token thing we do in terms of SARC, but that's neither here nor there. It's not going to lead anywhere. Uh, which is a pity. Uh, so, from India's point of view, the alternative is BIMSTEC, which contains all our neighbors uh, except uh, Pakistan. Unfortunately, Afghanistan is excluded uh, because of Pakistan <laughs> intervening geographically between India and Afghanistan, and then they are not part of the Bay of Bengal in any case. Uh, so, that is a direction in which I think India will now increasingly pay attention and uh, shift its uh, optic of uh, what is its neighborhood first policy away from SAR uh, to BIMSTEC because that also will give a boost to its Act East policy. So I think I should stop here. I'll give, I've given you an overview of uh, 
India's neighborhood first policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. You very well uh, gave an overview of the India's neighborhood first policy to summarize what you just spoke, although it was a very difficult task because you uh, mentioned a lot of things in a very short span of time, but I'd still like to summarize it. Uh, in the start, you mentioned about how to actually look at the neighborhood first policy of India. You talked about the need of the R to see it by a strategic perspective and emphasized on the relationship with China. And you also mentioned about every leader coming into power and declaring that they're going to work with the neighbors. You indirectly stated that peace between neighbors is a myth in the realm of international relations and talked about Russia's problems. Uh, uh, in addition to it, you left the audience with questions about big and small countries, big and small powers, basically. Furthermore, you focused on India's relations with Maldives, Sri Lanka, the US, Bangladesh, etc. And uh, moving towards the end, you declared India as being one of the most targeted nations in regard to terrorism and there being a lack of statement by neighbors, uh, by other states that states that India is causing a terrorism threat to India. Uh, you also mentioned uh, that uh, identity and ethnic linkages are another uh, concern for the first policy of India and moving towards uh, the the last point, the last point that you mentioned was about BIMSTEC and uh, and we should actually have wise policies. The neighbors, our neighbors should have wise policies as well as should we. So this was the entire summary that I could provide you. Now we shall be proceeding forward with the question and answer session. So the first question so we have received for you is, how do you think can India be assertive in the South China Sea? It would be. How do you? Could be. You see, yes. The yes. question, please. Uh, so the question is, how do you think can India be assertive in the South China Sea? Assertive in South China Sea. <laughs> Let me say, let's be assertive in Ladakh, which is much closer to home, and where we are facing a real challenge with forty thousand of our people, our soldiers. Uh, in a standoff with 40,000 of the Chinese uh, with uh, tanks and missiles and air force and everything else on the ready. I think we have a huge problem uh, on our hand uh, right next on, on our border and South China Sea is far away. But, 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 uh, we, um, in terms of our diplomatic position, our political statements, uh, we are emphasizing time and again uh, the concept of a free and uh, open uh, Indo-Pacific, about respect for the rule of law, uh, for UNCLOS, uh, to uh, uh, freedom of uh, navigation and freedom of uh, air flights. Uh, all these issues indirectly uh, point to what China is doing in the South China Sea. Number two, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we are doing exercises. Uh, with the uh, US and Japan, of course, in the Indian Ocean, but we're also doing it uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific, in the Sea of Japan. Uh, and that also uh, is a political and diplomatic signal uh, to, uh, to China uh, that uh, there is a, a concern uh, of uh, several countries in, in, the, in, in Asia and in the South China Sea region. Uh, about Chinese policies. We are also uh, trying to develop uh, um, increased understandings with ASEAN. Uh, we were repeatedly saying that ASEAN is uh, central uh, to the whole concept of uh, Indo-Pacific because uh, ASEAN, uh, or at least four countries of ASEAN are targeted by China and the South China Sea. Uh, but uh, um, ASEAN uh, also is very chary of, uh, of confronting China and is not comfortable with the idea of being caught between uh, uh, China on the one hand with which they have a very expanded uh, economic relationship and uh, other partners like US and potentially India, Australia, Japan, uh, which can then provide some degree of security cover. Uh, we are paying special attention to Indonesia because Indonesia is, is, is key in terms of shaping the ASEAN thinking increasingly on uh, what's happening in South China Sea and its militarization. So these are the ways in which we are politically and diplomatically uh, making our views known. Uh, I won't call it uh, assertion, 
but it is uh, it is uh, a part of our signaling about uh, the concerns we share uh, with uh, several countries about Chinese policies in South China Sea. Thank you, sir. Moving towards the next question. The question has been sent to us by Mr. Manish uh, in the Zoom chat box itself. I'd like to read it out for you. Uh, India's neighborhood first policy have had failures regarding the Pacific settlement of disputes like border disputes and water sharing with its neighbors. So what India should incorporate in the neighborhood first policy to resolve the disputes with its neighbors? Well, uh, I think this is a question which doesn't make any sense, whoever has asked it. In fact, if there are any water sharing agreements in the world which are as uh, generous and uh, as elaborate, these are water sharing agreements in, in, in South Asia. Look at the Indus Waters Agreement. 80% of the waters of the Indus system uh, went to Pakistan. Only 20% is with us, although we are a water shortage country. And this was agreed to us at a time uh, when uh, uh, climate change issues and others were not there and uh, the water problem was not staring uh, the country or at least there was not, not that realization that we had a serious uh, uh, water uh, problem issue in the offing in the years ahead. Look at the Ganges water agreement with Bangladesh at a time when we had very difficult relations with Bangladesh and Bangladesh went on an international campaign against us. But we signed that uh, Ganges water sharing agreement uh, with Bangladesh. And again, uh, despite the fact that India is a water short, uh, water deficit country, uh, we accepted our responsibility as the upper riparian uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to ensure uh, that the legitimate needs and demands of, the, uh, of these uh, countries, uh, the lower riparian countries, uh, were not uh, hurt in any way. Um, with Nepal, look, I have served in Nepal and uh, tried very hard to, to uh, implement some of the water projects, but uh, they never went anywhere. Uh, Bhutan is a very different story. Uh, issue with Bangladesh over Tista, again, government of India was ready uh, to actually sign that agreement when uh, uh, the West Bengal government, Mamta Banerjee, intervened, and it was not possible uh, to do that. But otherwise, uh, I think uh, the person who's asked the question hasn't studied the subject well enough to ask a sensible question. Thank you, sir. Moving towards the next question, it has been put forward by Mr. Krishna Sharma. How do you look at India-Nepal relations under Modi uh, under the Modi regime? as uh, Nepal had blockade and recent border tension in Kalapani and uh, Lipu Lake. Well, I would rather not, see, since you are sitting in Nepal, and I don't want to uh, say something harsh, but uh, I would say, I would say that uh, doing uh, such serious damage uh, to India-Nepal relationship uh, would cost both the countries a lot and unnecessarily. Uh, and uh, at a time when the Chinese were sitting on a border and committing aggression uh, for Nepal to start claiming uh, Indian territory and changing its maps and this and that and that, uh, to my mind was a diplomatic error. Insofar as the blockade issue is concerned, look, leave aside uh, the finer points or whether it was a blockade or whether it was the Madeshi who were up in arms because of the constitution issue, whatever else, leave that controversy aside because uh, we, not, we, may, we may not be able to agree as to what the reality of that was. But look, eh, look at our own relations with the United States. Uh, over the years, the United States has done enormous damage to us in terms of uh, uh, sanctions and uh, penalties and uh, uh, because of our non-proliferation policies, when we exploded our nuclear device, uh, the United States took umbrage and it uh, imposed all sorts of sanctions uh, on us. They kept, they created regimes, non-proliferation regimes, to actually uh, uh, constrain India's, uh, uh, even the civilian nuclear program, uh, denied us uh, technologies. 1971, uh, when uh, Bangladesh was created, the U.S. sent in its uh, U.S.S. Uh, to threaten us, right? Now, if you were to remember this and say, look, we are not going to 
uh, have normal relations, friendly relations with the United States because something had happened in the past and that is going to wear our minds. And we're not going to look ahead to the future. I think that's not responsible policy. Uh, and therefore to say, okay, since there was some sort of a blockade and we are unhappy and therefore we have every reason to cause deterioration of India and Nepal ties, to my mind, is not responsible policies. There are so many other elements in our relationship which, has to be, which have to be weighed in. And responsible governments don't make policies on the basis of acts which were considered unfriendly in the past. Thank you, sir. The next question has been sent to us by Ms. Kashi Yadav. I'd like to read it out. Uh, what would be the effect of aggressive Chinese military activities on the Indochina trade in short term as well as long term? Well, in the short term, uh, the impact would be relatively limited. As you know, we have banned uh, um, maybe two or three hundred uh, apps, Chinese apps. Uh, we began with 59, but we kept expanding that, uh, which then has encouraged some other countries to hit at some of these uh, apps. And I was, in, I was quite curious to see this morning, Pakistan has, has banned the TikTok also. Uh, <laughs> um, I think this worries China because China wants to dominate this space. And if a major country like India uh, opens the door to, to exclude uh, the expansion of Chinese companies, uh, then their fear is that uh, other countries uh, may also follow suit. Then we have uh, uh, removed uh, China from the list of countries which can automatically invest in India. Uh, each Chinese investment will now have to get permission, which itself will be, uh, means that they will be controlled. Not only that, if China tries to sell us things to other countries, uh, we have uh, uh, also uh, started looking very closely at the uh, uh, rules of origin. And more so, also, you know, if the Chinese companies hide behind consortia and this and that and that, uh, or or act through third countries, then we have developed uh, at least a policy. We have announced a policy of seeing who the ultimate beneficiaries are. Uh, so uh, I think these are uh, steps which will have uh, uh, medium-term uh, consequences. Uh, certainly, in terms of uh, uh, critical. Uh, supply chains. Uh, we will try and uh, move away from China uh, steadily, though for the moment uh, we are dependent on China, uh, for example, for our APIs, for our pharmaceutical industry. For uh, We have a huge solar uh, power program, but uh, all the panels are coming from China. Uh, so uh, there will be a delinkage de uh, progressively. Uh, there is no doubt about that because public opinion now is very much against uh, uh, against having uh, uh, closer economic ties with China, and it's not going to change. Uh, but uh, the delinking itself, the process of delinking itself, will take some time. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Moving towards the next question, since you talked about terrorism in your uh, welcome address, uh, I would like to ask you about how do you think India and Pakistan work on the issue of terrorism and its elimination as it hampers a lot of the internal structures in the other countries? Well, we've had a dialogue with Pakistan uh, since the middle 90s. Uh, and uh, terrorism has been on top of the issue. We were even made a lot of uh, concessions to Pakistan, very important political concessions. They said, no, no, but how can we only talk about terrorism? We must talk about Kashmir. We said, all right, we'll put Kashmir on the agenda also. Then they said, oh, uh, you know, this dialogue should not be interrupted because of terrorism. Uh, therefore, they wanted delinking the dialogue uh, from terrorism. We did that also. Within eight months of the Mumbai terror attacks, we resumed our dialogue with Pakistan. Uh, Modi initially also uh, took the initiative uh, to, uh, uh, to talk to Pakistan and, uh, and create the ground for uh, seriously looking at the issue of terrorism that was blocking bilateral ties. Uh, but that ran into nothing because at one stage Nawaz Sharif agreed, but there was such a backlash in Pakistan that you not uh, mention Kashmir, how can we only talk about terrorism? So that initiative also fell apart. So uh, 
And then after that, you've seen what happened in uh, surgical strikes in Barakot. And uh, so I don't think that it, there's any hope in the foreseeable future of uh, Pakistan uh, either giving up uh, the tool of uh, terrorism because they can't. You know, they have very highly developed uh, jihadi infrastructure in their own country. Uh, and the country is getting, as I said, increasingly radicalized. So the Pakistan government, uh, even if some elements in it wanted to think sensibly, will not take on these local forces because the terrorism will erupt within Pakistan also, more and more. Uh, they have had experience of this. So unfortunately, to my mind, uh, uh, there, is, there is no hope. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, moving towards the next question. What do you think should be the long-term plan of cooperation between India and China to make a common conclusion to the border and territorial disputes? They should start claiming our territory. It's a ridiculous thing. They want to claim the whole of our national Pradesh. On what basis? No, no Han ever set foot in, in what is the national Pradesh, ever. What is their basis? Because they occupy Tibet. Tibet, the Tibetans are not happy with the Chinese rule. They have been totally militarized. Uh, they have, in any case, China doesn't allow dissent uh, even in, in proper China, much less in uh, Tibet. Uh, so uh, their whole claim on uh, our territory is based on the occupation of Tibet. So it just is that we have not yet taken the uh, diplomatic uh, plunge, which would be a very serious step of. Uh, of uh, re-questioning uh, China's uh, uh, sovereignty over Tibet. Uh, but we got into this trap that we accepted uh, that Tibet was part of China beginning from 1954, literally realizing that this huge concession we made to them in the hope that they will respect uh, the uh, Himalayan barrier and not seek to, uh, and, and continue to treat Tibet as a kind of a buffer state between India and China, they have militarized Tibet. They have to, why have they? Why have they developed this massive infra, military infrastructure? For what? For, to to, to uh, suppress the non-violent Tibetans? No, it, it is because of their military challenge to India. So uh, I think the ball is in China's court. They have to behave as a responsible power. They can't uh, keep this expansionism is creating uh, problems for many many countries. Uh, I don't know what the reality is of uh, what I've seen in the press. It may be true, it may not be true, but they seem to have occupied some part of territory in, in northern Nepal, uh, which the Nepalese government is denying, probably rightly, probably wrongly, I don't know. Uh, but uh, China, is, China is a big problem. Even Bhutan, look at it, one of the smallest countries in the world. China is the third or fourth largest country in the world, and it claims territory in Bhutan. They're claiming even a, a, nat a nature reserve in, in uh, Bhutan, which cannot be accessed directly from Tibet, which can only be accessed uh, from Arunachal Pradesh. They've gone to that length. Thank you, sir. The next question for you is, uh, is the SAR losing its strength at the moment? Is our regional hub less a powerful compared to worldwide? If yes, then how can India contribute to strengthen the hub? Well, I think that question should be addressed to Pakistan. I mean, we, we have absolutely no difficulty at all or reservation of, about strengthening uh, SARC. In fact, uh, we've been pushing for sub-regional cooperation, this BPI in, uh, initiative or whatever. Uh, and as I said, uh, BIMSTEP, we have not projected that as an alternative. Uh, but uh, uh, it is for Pakistan to uh, to, to show a commitment uh, uh, to SARC and not bring in the bilateral differences with India to the point that this regional architecture has been uh, destabilized and it, it's not functional. Uh, even the trade agreement we have signed, uh, how can we have, you know, people say we should have more trade uh, amongst each other. We signed the free trade agreement on the, on the SARC, but Pakistan uh, will not trade with us. It will not give us the transit rights. In fact, if they were sensible about stabilizing Afghanistan, they should have allowed direct trade between India and Afghanistan because Afghanistan could have profited from this. Rather than India 
creating an air corridor or using Chabahar route to send uh, things to Afghanistan. So they're hurting Afghanistan also. So I'm afraid Pakistan is a problem for SARC. And that's why the, the organization is, uh, has not gained strength. So the next question has been sent by Mr. Keshav Bhardwaj. He says that we're surrounded by states with substantial, if not majority, uh, Muslim populations, including India's youth Muslim population, and increasing Islamic radicalization originating from the Islamic countries. Can you please comment about the possibility of a Pakistan subcontinent uh, Islamic revolution originating from the um, population which shall affect India's existence to a large extent? No, 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 let's not, let's not exactly. Well, India's existence, not existence as such, such but uh, India suffered uh, uh, severe uh, wounds uh, in its body politic when uh, uh, large parts of it were carved out and uh, made into Pakistan. Uh, and that happened because of, uh, uh, of Islam, it's quite clear. And the reason why Pakistan doesn't want to reconcile with India is because of Islam. And the reason why they are giving themselves even a stronger Islamic identity is because they want to develop a separate identity uh, with no roots to Indian civilization as much as possible. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, uh, India cannot be immune, uh, but uh, so far uh, India has been able to handle uh, its uh, Muslim population in terms of uh, participation in the Islamic State's uh, activities in, in West Asia, in fact, uh, countries like Maldives, uh, in, in per capita terms, <laughs> contributed the most of, uh, to the Islamic State fighters. Uh, in India, there have been very sporadic, uh, sporadic cases. Um, our, uh, in a way, one can say, I'm not saying that the situation is perfect or there are no problems. But in a, in, in a way, the Indian Muslims are lucky because it's the only country in the world where the Muslims are living in a genuinely democratic state. Um, and maybe that has been provided as a cushion. Uh, Bangladesh has, uh, has a serious uh, problem. We've seen terrorist attacks there. Uh, but uh, Bangladesh, I must say, I must compliment Sheikh Hasina at great risk uh, to herself and her party. She's dealt with these uh, uh, Jamaat Islami and others very, very strongly on the ground, and rightly so. Uh, Sri Lanka had, has had these terrible um, Islamic uh, uh, terrorist attacks and has learned its lessons, learned its lessons, and it's become, in fact, some of the steps they took uh, as a result of this are much beyond the steps India took. Uh, despite terror attacks uh, against Indian targets. Nepal has a Muslim population in the Tarai region. Uh, when I was uh, serving in Nepal in the middle 80s, uh, I had spoken to the then uh, uh, foreign minister of Nepal uh, to monitor a little bit more carefully uh, all the Bihari Muslims who had run away from uh, Bangladesh and had settled in the Tarai region close to the Indian border. And a lot of new mosques and everything had come up. But uh, he was uh, not very receptive. I won't go into what he said, but he was not very receptive. I don't think Nepal has a serious uh, problem of Muslims uh, today. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, in, in, the, in South Asia, uh, because of the Pakistan factor and the and uh, Pakistan being the uh, vehicle of uh, uh, transmission of radical uh, ideas and the activities of the ISI and its jihadi organization. There is an issue, but the issue is manageable and there's no question of any Islamic revolution. Certainly not. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot. Moving towards the next question how do you think india can uh, india can minimize the impact of its uh, domestic policy on its neighborhood first policy i don't see the 
I don't see the connection between uh, domestic policy and uh, neighborhood policy uh, because I don't, we have a <laughs> we have numerous domestic problems of all kinds, and the focus has to be on developing our economy and this post-COVID. Uh, uh, well, I would prefer to call it the Wuhan virus or the China virus. Uh, I mean, this is a huge problem for all of us uh, in India, in particular, because of the size of our uh, population. So we have a lot of these uh, issues that we have to uh, deal with. And insofar as relations with neighbors are concerned, uh, I don't see um, this affecting uh, our domestic policies, uh, affecting uh, our relationship with neighbors in, in any way. On the contrary, on the contrary, we've just signed with Maldives a, a debt relief uh, agreement as, as part of a global understanding that during this COVID business, uh, there should be some debt relief or, uh, uh, or delaying the debt repayments of uh, developing countries. We've done that in the case of uh, uh, Maldives. I think uh, Bangladesh may want it. We, I think we might be willing to uh, do that. Uh, I don't know the discussions with Nepal, but we uh, just had with Nepal a few weeks ago, uh, despite all the issues that are there on the political side, a foreign secretary level dialogue on uh, implementation of India's development programs uh, in uh, Nepal. And uh, I, have, I have the list of some of the things that have been agreed were agreed between Modi and uh, Oli uh, on developing connectivity, and those programs will certainly go ahead. Uh, similarly with uh, Bangladesh, uh, all the things that are on the table are going ahead as normal. Sri Lanka, uh, we have uh, announced additional uh, offer of uh, debt, uh, offer of uh, uh, development loan, uh, and uh, we're going ahead with the programs for housing and everything else. Uh, with Maldives, as I said, we made some special gestures. So I, I don't see any connection in terms of uh, our domestic policy and uh, our existing programs of uh, uh, development uh, cooperation uh, with, our, with our neighboring countries. Thank you, sir. Now I'll be taking the last question for the day, even though we have a lot of questions, but we cannot take all of them because of the time constraints. So the last question for the day is, can India lead South Asia in the post-COVID world? Uh, if yes, then how? I don't know what uh, leading uh, South Asia means in this regard. Uh, what India can certainly do and is doing, uh, not only with uh, in our neighboring countries, but also with Africa, uh, African countries, uh, is to uh, share our uh, expertise uh, in terms of uh, uh, dealing with this health challenge uh, because we've, uh, number two, in terms of, uh, which was a major step at the time when there was a huge concern about the uh, Im impact of this one virus on the population and the need to stock uh, medicines and everything else, uh, India accepted its international responsibility and agreed to supply uh, medicines uh, to the rest of the world, to the countries that uh, wanted it, US, Europe, and others, who were very thankful that India was willing to make this uh, gesture device, despite the needs of his 1.3 billion, uh, billion people. We've developed now huge capacities in terms of ventilators and uh, PPEs and this and that and that, uh, which we are willing to share. Indian Serum Institute, as you know, is the largest producer of vaccines in the world. Now, if a uh, vaccine gets developed, and India is collaborating with so many countries uh, to develop this, this vaccine. Uh, in terms of scaling it and producing in the quantities that are desired, uh, the Indian Serum Institute will play certainly uh, a, major, a major role. Uh, so uh, uh, there also, uh, India would certainly uh, be more than willing uh, to make sure that uh, uh, its own needs and the needs of its immediate neighbors uh, are met. As you know, we are fighting on the international at the international level against uh, protection of IPRs or pricing these vaccines at levels at which developing countries can buy. Uh, and this is something which we are doing as part of our responsibility uh, towards ourselves and more so towards developing countries in general, in which the neighbors 
uh, in fact, a high priority. So indirectly there again, we are, if you like, leading in inverted commas, <laughs> South Asia, in terms of protecting uh, its future health interests. Uh, we are now, as you know, presiding in the WHO. And there again, uh, we will uh, make sure that uh, whatever the WHO does uh, will serve the interests of developing countries, in which, as I said, again, our neighboring countries will have, uh, will have uh, the prime position. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lord. It was a very insightful session to, with you. And with this, we come to the end of the session. Uh, before I say anything, sir, you have been constantly mentioning this fact that you're based in Nepal. And I, I, I know that this think tank is based in Nepal, but I'm an Indian. Uh, and I've been working with since a very long time. So I just wanted to mention that because you mentioned it around three, four times that the think tank is uh, mentioned in Nepal. Anyway, uh, as we come to the end, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for your presence and for especially you for agreeing to uh, agreeing to be a part of the lecture series that the uh, nice. Uh, usually goes for. And uh, I'd also like to thank the volunteer team who has worked behind the back, as well as I'd also like to thank Pramosa for providing all the relevant uh, encouragement and support. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye.